Thank you for joining us this evening for Founders Symposium, an evening of non-conventional wisdom. Please welcome to the stage Chancellor Pradeet Klosla. This is the stage. Good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, it is so good to see so many familiar faces uh, at this event, which is a very important event. In fact, one of my most favorite events of the year. So we are just kicking off the celebration of what we call the Founders Day. And this has become now, uh, this has become part of our culture to do this year after year since our 50th anniversary. But this year is very special. Now, who would have imagined 58 years ago that we would be one of the top research institutions in the country? When Roger Ravel was thinking about creating UC San Diego, uh, after going through multiple name changes, I'm so glad that we settled on UC San Diego and not UC La Jolla or UC some, or Balboa uh, Park or something else. Uh, we represent not just San Diego, we represent the UC system and this great state of California. Now, who would have imagined 50 years ago when we created the School of Medicine that this would be one of the top schools of medicine in the country? So, to everybody out there on the video and the leadership today, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brenner, who's our Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garfin, who's our interim dean for our School of Medicine. Thank you. And thank you, Patty Mason, who's the CEO of our hospital. Uh, and this is the current leadership, and before them, many other people have contributed to building a very strong school of medicine in our hospital system. Now, who would have imagined six years ago, when we were doing our strategic plan, that we would actually become a connected campus. And we are becoming connected in two different dimensions. We are becoming connected physically. So if you see traffic jams on five, it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm just trying to build a bridge to connect our hospital to our school of medicine and to the rest of the campus so that we can be a physically connected campus, so that we can be an intellectually connected campus where we can build multiple programs, whether it be the School of Public Health or the Tata Institute for Genetics uh, or the Halajulu Data Sciences Institute, we want to build programs that congeal and gel multiple different disciplines at UC San Diego together and show the way going into the future. And this is what you're going to see this evening. Three amazing faculty members, uh, three stars, or superstars, I should say, people, leaders in their own right, in their own field, changing the way we think, trying to be traditional while being non-traditional simultaneously, putting that added twist to their work, which is what makes UC San Diego so unique. So welcome, everybody. And to say a few more things about UC San Diego is my dear colleague, our Executive Vice Chancellor, Dr. Elizabeth Simmons. Please, welcome. Thanks very much, Chancellor Kosla. And thank you all for joining us here for what I think is going to be an absolutely fantastic evening. Um, it's wonderful that we take the time each year to celebrate the founders of the university and the founders of the units that make up the university. I also love this event. Um, I think it's truly a joyous time when we just come together to celebrate what makes the university so special. And from starting 58 years ago as an experiment in higher education, we've now attracted creative minds who are drawn to stunningly hard problems that most people would shrink from. And instead, we have those creative minds consider those challenges from multiple perspectives, looking from all angles, and taking cross-disciplinary approaches to find truly unexpected solutions. The values of innovation and integrity and entrepreneurial spirit that pervade our university and that were established by the founders have created an atmosphere here, an environment that's like no other university. And we see members of our academic community encouraging one another to take 
cross-disciplinary approaches that produce transformative scholarship and insightful artistic creations, and groundbreaking discoveries that enhance human life and our global society. So tonight, we will shortly be joined by three absolutely outstanding speakers who are carrying forward our renowned non-tradition. And uh, I'll say a few words about each of them. So first, we will hear from Kim Rubenstein, a nationally known theater director and faculty member in the Department of Theater and Dance. She works across campus to teach acting and directing, and also the art and science of communication itself. Using methods from improvisational theater and journalism and her own system for optimal creative thinking, Professor Rubenstein um, helps students and faculty find the spark that motivates their work and develop their unique style and voice for connecting to audiences with authenticity and meaning. So she will be our first speaker. Our second speaker will be Eric Heckler. And Professor Heckler is, just to put it simply, changing the way that we deliver population health. He's a faculty member in the Department of Family and Public Health and a member of the Design Lab and the director of the Center for Wireless and Population Health in the Qualcomm Institute. So he keeps busy just moving among the different places that he belongs to. And Professor Heckler seeks to improve health through evolving digital technologies, human-centered design, and system-level interventions in clinical and community settings. So he'll be our second speaker. And then our third speaker will be Sasha Gershinov, who is a, me a research meteorologist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He explores the interrelated aspects of climate and society, and especially extremes of, uh, extremes of weather. Um, he looks, for example, at the impact of the marine layer on coastal heat waves, and the impact of the Santa Ana winds on uh, wildfires, energy, and public health. And based on the national coverage of the devastating wildfires across our state in the last week, I think that the deep importance of his work is fully evident to all of us. So before we get to hear from our featured speakers, I'd like to invite my colleague, the Vice Chancellor for um, Health Sciences, David Brenner, to say a few words, and congratulations on the 50th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. On behalf of Health Sciences, I'd like to very briefly tell you about this building, the Denny Sanford Medical Education. As Pradeep pointed out, it's a great place to have a party, but it actually does more than that. It's, it's, it's really a fantastic site, isn't it? It's really, yeah. But, but besides that, it, it, it's really the state-of-the-art place to, to educate medical students. It also is a place where we do research and advanced um, surgical techniques. And I don't know if you know this, but um, residents in different medical specialties throughout the world come here. They rotate through here to get advanced training. So we really, it's a, it's a national and international um, resource, and it reflects um, the commitment of UC San Diego to all three missions of an academic medical center to, to educate the next um, generation of physicians and also, in our case, in pharmacists, to, to do research and provide the community with outstanding, outstanding um, patient care. So now I, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Steve Garfin, the new dean of, um, of the School of Medicine, and who is committed to helping all of us in, in to do all three missions better. Professor Garfin. <laughs> well, I'm new here, and so I have notes. But um, when, when, we, when I got the handout from the development office, there's this thing up top that says VOG. Um, I didn't quite know what it meant, but I guess in theater and stuff, it means voice of God. So <clears throat> I want I to I wanna point out to Pradeep and to Elizabeth, when you were introduced, the VOG is a female. Right. That's diversity. <laughs> so thank you, David, for your introduction. Uh, I, like David Brenner, also trained here at UCSD. David was a fellow years ago. I came here after graduating medical school at the University of Minnesota. I finished my orthopedic surgery residency here and then went away for a fellowship 
and have been back on the faculty since. I was appointed chair of orthopedics in 1996 and interim dean in April of this year. Fifty years ago, UC San Diego welcomed its inaugural class to the region's fledgling School of Medicine with a commitment to bridge innovative research, medical education, and patient care to produce compassionate, highly skilled physicians and scientists, resulting in high quality as well as cutting edge clinical care and treatments. UCSD has kept pace and has worked hard to get ahead of the curve in terms of 21st century healthcare and medical education, which have been rapidly changing and hard to keep up with. Most people enter the healthcare field because they want to make a difference, to help people, to end pain and suffering. It is a noble cause. But in today's world, how do we balance that purpose with the reality of healthcare? How do we train the next generation of healthcare leaders to be technologically, culturally, and globally competent? How can we support and keep professionals in a field that is very fatiguing, rapidly changing in knowledge and how we practice medicine and surgery, and unfortunately is associated with a high burnout rate? How can we make education accessible when the majority of students require financial aid? How do we welcome leaders from different walks of life to add cultural richness to the profession. These are some of the areas we are addressing at UCSD. Many of our students come here because of our reputation for working on these issues in creative ways. Students and faculty have access to exciting new and technologically advanced training in patient care areas like the Jacobs Medical Center and the huge growth of the campus around it, including the Komen Outpatient Pavilion Altman Clinical and Translational Research, and the Morris Cancer Center, which is a National Cancer Center Institute designated level one cancer center, and the Shiley Eye Center, soon to be expanded with the $50 million Viterbi Family Vision Research Center. These facilities complement our Hillcrest Hospital, the student-run free clinic, which you may have seen out there, uh, and initiatives in binational border health, gender equity, and health equity. Our community is a living, learning, training ground for innovations in medical education and service. Importantly and critically, we have a strong interconnectedness with the main UCSD campus. Though these partnerships may not be obvious in how they work together, they are one reason this is a unique incubator for new ideas, innovations, discoveries, and education. The presenters of the program are prime examples of these unconventional interrelationships. Tonight you are going to hear about some novel ways in theater, wireless communication, and climate change in which UC San Diego aims to solve some grand challenges in health. We hope you enjoy the program and share in our excitement. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kim Rubenstein. Hello. Whoa, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi. I'm here to communicate with you, which is why all you will see on these huge, gigantic screens tonight is this little baby. But I'm not, I don't know how to do a PowerPoint presentation, sorry. Um, so this is me, the human being, talking to you. So when I, I have been fascinated from birth with human behavior and with authenticity, with what it, whatever that means. And um, I became a theater person to research that, really, and to be able to be in relationship to other human beings, trying to create human relationship and conflict for all of you. I'm having a trouble hearing myself talk, so that's why I'm st stopping a little bit. Um, so I, when I became a theater director, my work, here's the thing about theater. People have an idea that people in the theater 
wear masks all the time, that our work is to put on masks. But it is really the opposite. When I train actors and when I work with actors, professional actors, my work is to actually crack through the masks to get to the pure behavior, to get to something that is true. If you watched actors wearing masks, it would totally irritate you. We wear masks every day of our lives, don't we? We pretend. An actor is the opposite. An actor is a shaman for the truth, a vessel for communicating the most complicated details, the subtle complicated details of human behavior, which are contradictory, slippery, elusive. So I guess by that, because of that, I am actually made to teach people about communication. Um, when we were in a theater department meeting a few years ago, we were trying to figure out how do we save the theater department. And so we talked a lot, there was a lot of conversation about how do we get people to come to see our plays. And suddenly I had one of those epiphanal moments that now I teach of, aha, what w maybe what we really need to do is reach into the UCSD community and help the community understand what we really do here, which is everything that I just described. We are dedicated to the creative process and to in, uh, strengthening the parts of our brains and our hearts, and if I may say soul in this room at the University of California, San Diego, to uh, reach out to audiences and make a difference. So I, my colleague and I got obsessed with what parts of the brain are responsible for creative thought, for leaps of creative revelation, for those amazing aha moments that come to the brain like some kind of lightning bolt from above. What makes that happen? And how can we, because we work in the creative process all the time, help everyone, not just people who want to knit or people think creativity is something soft. Excuse me, that's bullshit. It is not soft. People think, oh, that's so much fun what you do. It is not always fun, it is hard. It requires breaking our hearts, it requires breaking convention, it requires trying to find some sort of path to what is new and useful in the world. So we got grants to go around the country and meet with neuroscientists and cognitive scientists who are all also searching, as we are, into the unknown, into the great darkness, to try to answer this question about what makes the mind create, particularly invent, yes? And I, and I took those, what I learned, and isolated 10 different facets of the creative mind to train. And I've developed a training system to train those facets of the creative mind, or what you might call attributes or talents of the creative mind. And I started a class called Cultivating the Creative Mind. I have half my time left, can you believe it? Anyway, Cultivating the Creative Mind, which I taught to undergraduates, 40 from all over campus, three times, extremely successful class, in which I trained them through an embodied process because Einstein said that nothing changes unless something moves. And so instead of just sitting around the desks together, we stood up in a room and we've tried, we, we worked on this systematically, this process of building parts of the mind 
that are specifically, we think right now, uh, related to creative thought and creative thought across disciplines. Uh, <clears throat> I was then asked by the graduate division to teach graduate students in post-ops uh, workshops on communicating science. So we've taught maybe about 12 workshops, communicating research, that's not just for scientists, to post-docs and graduate students. They're four-day workshops. Now we want to make them three days. Very intensive, and they have been immensely transformative for the people who take them, including people who have said that their research changed, their research grew and transformed from these workshops. Then I was asked by the biology department and the physical sciences to do a series of workshops for the faculty. And we got a grant from the Moore Foundation, a big grant, and actually we've just heard that we got another one two days ago, yes, and <clears throat> we've been, those are two-day workshops. They're probably going to turn into one-day workshops because people think, communication, give it to me fast. Give me a, just a thing that tells me how to be a good communicator. Don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this. That is not really what communication is. It's not a checklist. Communication is a radical connectivity. And the reason I have this image is because our initial connectivity, our primal first connection, is with our umbilical cord. Yes? We are connected in this universe of a womb with our mothers who nourish us. They communicate with us through their nourishment. That is what communication is. When you are speaking to people, you are nourishing them. And the hope is, is that you will be nourished back. <laughs> then we get cut off. We go into the world, and we have to stand somehow in the world in the authority of our own truth, in the authority of our own voices and try to make a difference. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first thing that we do in these workshops is that, you know, in order to make this connection, like if I had an umbilical cord right now and I was like connecting it to all of you, I'd have to have a lot of them. If I want to plug into all of you as I talk to you, trying to see the people back there, how do I do that? The first thing that we do is we turn inside of the self and try to remember who we are, why we even are in the fields we are in, why it matters to us, why I do what I do, why you guys do what you do. Not because somebody put you in a lab and so you're doing it, but why are you a biologist to begin with? Somebody told me this gorgeous story of he became a biologist because he was lost in the woods when he was a little kid, and he climbed up into a tree as the sun was setting, and the sounds of the animals and the trees rustling saved him, and he's now a biologist. So we start with authenticity of self, and we take that authenticity of self and we connect it to the other. And we do that through juicy language, what I call juicy language, because language is action. When you speak language that both matters to you and to the people that you're talking to, that you are actually creating change. It is an action. And choosing the right kinds of words, the words that will compel, the words that will like land on somebody like a, like a tattoo and not be forgotten, the images that you create, we want to be able to communicate not just our expertise, 
but the way in which words are like fingers almost, right? They can reach out and stroke somebody in a good way. We're not talking about harassment here. Well, in, in a good, maybe, in a good way. So I, I know I have 53, I'm 53, I don't know what that means. I'm gonna take one more minute, okay? <laughs> maybe two. Um, so we do it through language, uh, image, we try to understand that when I speak to you, I am trying to create image in you. And I can do that through language. I can do it through emotional presence, and I need to speak about this. We are all hurting right now. We are in a time, at least in my long lifetime, like I have never been in. We are all on fire. And we need to be able to talk to each other. We need to be able to talk to the very people that we do not understand. That we go, what? How can you think like that, right? How do we learn to have enough courage, which is in our hearts, core being the Latin word for courage, how do we learn to have enough courage to listen radically to each other, to listen beyond understanding? Because it is only there in that space between what I think and what you think. That's diversity. That's diversity of thought. And if we are a university that is about diversity, I mean, the science department and the arts department didn't talk about other education stuff, <laughs> right? And there's uh, people who come to these workshops, they're like, whoa, I didn't know that theater people didn't just jump around and act weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we need to learn that. We need to learn that in emotional presence doesn't mean emoting, which is an old paradigm. It means being authentic. And this is the last thing I will say about that before I end. I have many people who come to these workshops, and I'm gonna say particularly women, but not just because I'm a woman, because it's true, who say, I am told, do not show your feelings, do not be pet too passionate when you speak about your science in particular. And I say that for the second time, that is bullshit. We must talk to each other from our feelings, from the braveness and the courage of our hearts in order to get past. It has, we need a new paradigm. And the diversity of thought is something that we need to hold with care, to hold like a baby in a womb. When the man, I know, when the man landed on the moon, remember Neil Armstrong? He looked like that. Do you see pictures of him? He's like upside down in a space outfit, <laughs> in space. I mean, he's in this fetal position. And he's got an umbilical cord attached to the mother load. And he lands on the moon after being in the vast womb of the sky to be in a new world. And he is emotional. And did anybody ever say to Neil Armstrong, don't be emotional, that's being too emotional, when he landed on the moon? No. So I plead with you, there's many more things to tell you, but I'm done, I'm way done. Um, <laughs> I plead with you to get out your umbilical cords. Have patience with people who may not think the way you think, who think as I did when I was young that the moon was cut out of the sky and it was just a white, white world, that I wanted to get in and find out the mysteries. I think scientists and artists are doing that. Let's work together, all of us, and move forward. Thank you. 
I didn't say half of what I was Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor Eric Heckler. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, and so I want to talk to now, actually, she brought up, we need a new paradigm. And that's actually a key thing I want to discuss, flipping the paradigm to achieve precision health. So first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I think of myself a little bit like a misfit toy. <laughs> Why? Well, I'm trained as a clinical health psychologist, but I also think of myself as a designer, a control systems engineer, a public health person. I'm a mix mash. I don't really fit in anywhere exactly. But I got to tell you, one of the reasons why I love being here is I feel like I've found that island. And let me tell you a little bit more about that. But first, why did I become a misfit toy? Well, it's because I wanted to solve something really complex. I wanted to figure out how to help everyone live a healthier, productive life. That's hard. That's really hard to do. Look, this is a, a slide that a, a colleague of mine, Kevin Patrick, has, right? Of all of these different things that have an impact on our health, from the environment, obviously uh, genes, microbiome, and uh, as a clinical psychologist, I spend a lot of time thinking about behavior, of course, right? Um, all of these things have a big impact on uh, how we live uh, and how we can achieve a healthier life, okay? So, if we want to try to figure out how to handle this, we need actually a health process that can handle that complexity. And so we have this vision of precision health. Now, it builds on precision medicine, if you've heard that phrase, but we're even going beyond the audaciousness of that goal. Our goal is to embrace all of that complexity, embrace the dynamics that are involved in health, to get the right solution for the right person at the right time. And by solution, we mean breaking down the barriers between healthcare and public health and seeing that as a spectrum, from pharmaceuticals to medical devices to behavioral interventions to policies to environmental. All of these things actually have an impact on our health. How do we get the right intervention at the right time for the right person? Now, to do that requires you to actually think pretty differently about how we actually evaluate. And so you need to break down another paradigm, this classic separation between practice and science. And that's why we think about this as creating a culture of continuous iterative improvement, such that they are constantly flowing back and forth between each other. So that's pretty ambitious, right? How the heck are we going to pull that off? Well, let's start with some assumptions. And I think this builds very much on Kim's presentation. So here's the assumption. People are different, context matters, and both change. What do you think? Okay. Okay, so if, if we agree with this assumption, it challenges the classic way that we've been doing health sciences. Okay, and let me just unpack why. So the classic way that we've been doing health sciences is ways we run randomized control trials or observational studies. Our goal is to come up with evidence-based recommendations and interventions, which then get disseminated and implemented within clinics and communities. And then through those clinics and communities, people are helped, right? Sound right to everybody? So now, what if people are different, context matters, and things change? Well, the way that this works is through averages, okay? So the top of this paradigm where everything starts is by figuring out what works on average. Well, what is an average but averaging out differences in people, place, and time? So it actually doesn't work with the assumptions. Shoot. <laughs> what do we do? Well, and by the way, let me be very explicit. I am so glad that we have had this science, right? To come back to the tradition. This has given us a foundation on what does work in general. It's a fantastic starting point, right? And it enables the next paradigm that we're moving towards, that we are flipping towards. And so why flipping the paradigm? Quite literally, we just start by helping individuals, figuring out how we help clinics and communities, and then produce generalizable knowledge. I'm going to be working through quite a few examples of this to help you understand how this would actually work. But the long and the short of it is, the starting point of this is, can I achieve success for the individual I'm trying to help? And by individual, that doesn't have to be a person. 
It could be, but it could also be a region, a city, a state, a nation. It's, an, it's one, it's an individual, but it's a unit, right? And if we can actually achieve success there, can we translate that success and tool to somebody else and some other communities like them, right? And then, as we do that with more and more people, we actually build an, a usable evidence base. And notice this, the knowledge of the evidence base is different. It's not what works on average, it's what works for whom and in what context and at what time. It's built into the science when it's this way. And then you build the recursive pattern back up where you start building it. That is a culture of continuous improvement. You see it? So let me walk through some examples on how we've been advancing this in my center and, and all of my partnerships across the university. So, oh, shoot, forgot one thing. Of course, we're not the first ones to figure this out. This is the same basic logic that software development figured out a while ago, right? It used to be called waterfall, and now we talk about agile development. It was basically recognizing that the world's too complex to plan for. And so we just got to iterate. That's a short summary statement, right? So then how do you do this? Let me give you some examples. First, so this little app, this is an app I developed with my colleague Daniel Rivera and others. It, on the front end, it looks just like any other little walking app, right? But on the back end, this is driven by control systems engineering. So let me tell you how it works. What we do is we actually, when someone signs up and starts using this, the app is actually building, doing little experiments. They experience it just as an intervention. But the app's running little experiments to figure out what is influential for you, each person, their physical activity. So for some people, when they're stressed, they walk more. For some people, when they're stressed, they walk less. For some people, stress doesn't matter. It's day of the week or something else. This, we start by honoring the diversity and uniqueness of each person and building a model for that. We then use that to predict what they're going to do if we give them different options. This is called a controller. The controller then makes all these dynamic decisions, right? Now, thinking about helping individuals to the community or clinic, the controller is basically that second level, right? Because we can give the controller to just about anybody, and it'll because it's a model that's recursive, it can figure it out, right? But now, as we're learning more and more people and helping more and more individuals, we're building completely different individual models for each person. And now we're starting to produce generalizable knowledge of what works for whom in what context, the different style of generalization. So this is a control systems way of doing that. We've also been advancing it using computer science methods. This is with my colleagues Peja Kloshnia and Susan Murphy. And we're exploring it with other behaviors. Joe Godino is the PI of this project for uh, weight loss, so including diet and stress management and whatnot. So that's one area. But you can flip this again. What if it's not about actually building a tool to help someone, but actually helping people help themselves? And so this is my friend and colleague, Dana Lewis. So Dana is a person with type 1 diabetes with no formal training as an engineer. But here's the cool thing about Dana. She built her own artificial pancreas system, open sourced it online, and now there's about 900 people that are using this basic script that she built. It's a part of a community called We Are Not Waiting and Open APS. Now, I'm actually not talking about that. Dana is amazing. What I'm talking about is how do we allow other people to do what Dana did? That is the focus of our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded project. We are opening pathways for innovation, unlocking the knowledge and expertise that each person has to solve their own problems. And indeed, this flipped paradigm, that little model, that grew out of this grant and this project. Dana helped me to really understand that at a, at a, at a real depth. So, um, this is one example. A second example is work I'm doing with a group called Project Apollo. There's actually a few of them here in the room, Gloria and Tyler. Thank you guys for being here. Um, and this is with Dr. Mike Carisu. He's a professor here at UCSD as well. Basically, the thing that binds this group is that they came to the healthcare system, they did everything that they were told to do, and they didn't get the answers that they needed. And so what we're working on is using and providing methods to help them do self-experimentation in an ethical, safe way as part of a community and a clinic. To help, we're not gonna promise them that we're gonna find the answers or give them the answers, but we do promise them that we will honor their individuality and honor their ability to find the answers for themselves. And so we're working on advancing that. Again, helping individuals, helping building out communities, and then through that, our desire is to build generalizable knowledge. 
moving this on, we're not just thinking about this at an individual level, we're also thinking about this at a regional level. So this is designed for San Diego. This is led by my colleague Stephen Dow. Again, this is now into the design lab part of my world. What we're working on here is helping San Diego redesign itself, enabling all of our citizens to take part in thinking through what the future of our city should be. And we're doing similar sorts of things in actually rural Appalachia. This is led by my colleague Eli Aronoff Spencer uh, in partnership with the FCC and CI and Amgen. So those are some examples of all the front end pieces. But thinking about how complex this is, this requires a lot of changes on the back end. And so this is what my center is all thinking about. These are this honeycomb. We're thinking about how does this, what are the implications for measurement, for thinking about privacy, for thinking about how we flip our research ethics. All of this is part of our process and thinking, right? So why? With this, we think we can actually achieve this audacious goal of precision health. But we, we're not doing this alone. This is, I hope you hear this. This is not an I. This is a we. This is my center. Uh, these are all the people working on this with that honeycomb model. As I said before, I am a transdisciplinary misfit toy. I'm a member of the design lab. This is the group that we're working on at a community level. Um, of course, we are all resided within the Qualcomm Institute, these two institutions. Um, and last but certainly not least, I am a member proudly of the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health. This is a place where, listen to the name, we are spreading healthcare and public health. It's right there. We can think at the systems level if we work together. And so I ask if we can partner to find a healthier future. We are really looking for that. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, research meteorologist Sasha, Sasha Gershinoff. <laughs> Now is when I uh, really wish that I had taken Kim's uh, communications course. <laughs> uh, well, my name is uh, written Alexander, but it's pronounced Sasha. And uh, this, this is because Sasha is nicknamed for Alexander, where I come from, and they speak like this. A very large and very aggressive country. <laughs> the ones that helped our president get elected. Um, I am a meteorologist, uh, and a statistician, and I believe most of you, I mean all of you know what a meteorologist is, and uh, for those of you who are not sure what a statistician is, it's somebody who doesn't have enough personality to become an accountant. <laughs> but this, uh, I'm serious, and, and this is what makes me a climatologist climate being the statistics of weather. Um, I represent here a small and growing group at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography um, that uh, thinks about uh, um, weather, regional weather patterns and weather extremes and uh, how they're related to climate variability and climate change. And um, we assess uh, and studied a range of uh, regional weather extremes uh, and their impacts on society. A lot of the things that we study hinges on water vapor in the atmosphere. And this is what um, uh, connects them in a, in a very um, intimate way to the oceans. We're also interested in education and uh, engagement of stakeholders and the public, uh, since we're looking at uh, impactful extremes. So um, our, um, uh, to our work, we have uh, recently and very vigorously added public health impacts uh, with the recent hire of a young and very dynamic uh, faculty member uh, who is uh, jointly hired at the School of Medicine and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Tariq bin Marnia. Uh, we, we have been developing a vigorous collaboration with him, uh, looking at the impacts of weather extremes on health and the changing climate. And uh, Tariq was actually supposed to give this talk, but since he is working in Chile this week, uh, you have yours truly. 
I would like to run through two, three examples of the kind of things that we study and their connections to health. Uh, the most uh, typical extreme that people think of, uh, or certainly the, the extreme that's most directly connected to climate change are heat waves. Specifically in California, heat waves like in all the other places in the world are on the rise. Uh, but in California, uh, it's not just that the heat waves are increasing, but they're also getting more humid. So the flavor of heat waves is changing. And it's changing, and it's, uh, denoted in, it's reflected in the, in the blue colors on this graph. And um, uh, humid heat waves have very special uh, or impacts on health. They're kind of a double whammy. Uh, because uh, not only is it more difficult to weather ex uh, extreme heat when it's humid, but uh, with a lot of humidity in the air, it doesn't really cool off at night. So we don't have that respite to be able to better handle another day of scorching heat. And those humid heat waves actually uh, also tend to be longer, longer lasting. Now, um, we can do this kind of experiment in a, in a climate model that's been vetted for its ability to simulate heat waves in California. Uh, and uh, we can see that, it, that uh, uh, certainly heat waves will increase in the future. We know that. But in California, it's really this humid type of heat wave that's increasing. And this has a lot of implications for intervention strategies because, uh, because when heat is humid, uh, and it doesn't cool off at night, the same intervention strategies that you use for daytime heat don't really work. Heat waves uh, and other extremes are more often studied in the developing world uh, and in the low and medium income countries that tend to suffer the most from uh, climate impacts. There is a paucity of uh, studies, and we certainly hope to take the tools that we develop in this data-rich environment of California and take them to the developing world where they're more sorely needed. So for example, in the whole continent of Africa, there are fewer studies on health and heat than in the city of Phoenix alone. Uh, climate change is not uniform around the globe. And so here's a picture of uh, precipitation as it's projected to change by the end of the century. And you can see the green colors that denote that most of the, the world is getting wetter. Uh, and that makes sense because in a warmer atmosphere, there's more moisture. Uh, but some places are projected to get drier. And these are the Mediterranean climate regimes of the world. Uh, also the places that wine grapes prefer. California is very different from these. Now, all of these, including California, uh, sit on the boundary between the subtropics and the middle latitudes. So we have subtropical dry weather in, in the summer, middle latitude storms in the winter that bring us all of our rain. Uh, as the climate changes, the subtropical zone expands and basically the dry season becomes longer. This is happening in California also. But uh, in California, the extreme storms in the middle of winter, the atmospheric rivers that carry moisture from the tropics, uh, and when they hit the mountains, the coastal mountain ranges, that moisture is squeezed out of them. And these are the rivers in the sky that produce most of our extreme precipitation events, contribute greatly to our, um, uh, to our hydroclimate. And uh, they are very clearly becoming much stronger. Now, uh, this changes the hydroclimate in, in uh, uh, very important ways, and there are major implications in uh, all sorts of disciplines for this uh, beyond water resource management and other things. There are certainly implications to health because events like this, when, uh, for example, in two 2017, in February, 
uh, an atmospheric river overwhelmed the sewer system of Tijuana and millions of gallons of raw sewage spilled into Imperial Be Beach. And these, these are the sorts of things that we're trying to assess the health impacts from. And so the connections to climate are obvious, but very complex. Um, also, because precipitation regime is, is becoming more spiky, and more of the total annual precipitation hinges on that one, two, three big storms of the year, uh, the hydroclimate of California, which is also, which is already very volatile, is becoming more variable. So we've seen an example of that in the last couple of decades when we had uh, uh, prolonged droughts punctuated by deluges. And uh, another impact that this, this has, this is the last thing I'm gonna show in terms of impacts, um, is on fire weather and climate. And so as the summertime dry season gets longer and precipitation is pushed out of this region forward, uh, especially in the fall, we have dry fuels that are more and more likely to persist into the peak of the Santa Ana wind season that is shown in that histogram. It peaked, Santa Ana winds actually peak in December and January. And so you have more and more likely to have dry fuels at the time when the Santa Ana is the most active. And so an event like uh, the Thomas fire that occurred in December and burned for weeks and then was ended by an atmospheric river that caused debris flows uh, in Santa Barbara uh, is a harbinger of the kind of things that, uh, that we expect to see more and more often in the future. And unfortunately, it looks like uh, this uh, year is, is developing along similar lines. Now, uh, besides the direct impacts of wildfires that are devastating, there, there are also downwind smoke indirect impacts on a much larger coastal population. So as we add smoke to the steam and add more complexity, uh, things become more interesting, more difficult to explain, uh, and also and also more nuanced in terms of their health impacts and other impacts as well. And so we, we need some way to convey that information more clearly. And this is, I think, where art uh, can be our friend. And um, let me close with this. Uh, these artworks basically span the range of, of the science that I was talking about from the human influence on the global climate and from the global climate change influencing uh, having local impacts, the most personal of impacts on public health. Um, from these humble beginnings at UCSD, with the kind of collaboration between the School of Medicine and uh, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, we hope that we're helping to position UCSD as the place for climate and health research and education. And we're dreaming of bringing students from the developing world with specific problems that already exist in their regions and helping them solve these problems as they do their, as they work on their thesis in a, a possibly future discipline in climate and health at UCSD, and then go back to their homes and uh, become part of an expanding network of UCSD alumni and friends that work to to mitigate the imp the impacts on health from. Uh, weather extremes in a changing climate. Of course, for that to happen, we're going to have to expand much more broadly beyond Scripps and the School of Medicine to uh, harness
talent in uh, policy, GPS, technology, Cal 82, and I hope art, the art community. Um, actually, the art that I'm showing here is part of an art collection that we're jump-starting right now at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It's art inspired by the science done at Scripps. And um, I believe that this collaboration with artists will help promote our mission and will inspire more relevant science for the benefit uh, of uh, future generations, to brighten up the future as much as we can. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm extremely wowed. Can we give Kim, Eric, and Sasha a big hand? As I was listening to my colleagues, I realized that I should be listening to them more often. <laughs> Maybe I learned something. Thank you. So remind me to listen to you more often, listen to you with my heart and mind open, right? And listen to you when you come and touch us in a good way. So that's very important. Second thing I realized is what a great privilege it is to be at the helm of this great institution where colleagues like this are changing the way we think, changing the way we do things, and changing society around us. But the most important revelation was what a privilege it is for this institution to be in the midst of you all. You've been nurturing us as donors. You've been nurturing us. You've been encouraging us. You've been challenging us. And I hope you keep on doing that because without you, we would not be who we are. And we want to be better than we are. And we want you to be part of pushing us. So thank you very much for being here this evening. There's dessert and coffee out there. There is no Q&A, but you can talk to our colleagues uh, informally over coffee and dessert. So thank you very much. <laughs>